These are the skulls of holy men. Some have lain here for more than a thousand years. They were monks of Athos. The monastic life is bearing the cross of Christ. A monk is someone who has been crucified with Christ. Sometimes the monks refer to themselves as the living dead. Christian monastic centers on earth. For the whole Orthodox world, Athos is a beacon, a powerhouse, and that has been the case for a thousand years. We see Athos as a place where the purity of the Orthodox faith is preserved. At times of crisis, when there was a danger of compromising the true faith. It was the monks of Athos who defended the integrity of orthodoxy. Athos is a spiritual island of worship, a time capsule, where the monks follow a life of austerity. It is a lush peninsula jutting out into the Aegean off the northern seaboard of Greece. Athos is an independent monastic state with a charter ratified by international treaty, one of the world's few politically protected shrines. The historical roots lie deep in the great Orthodox Christian empire of Byzantium, which dominated Western civilization from the fourth century AD until the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Its spiritual origins go back to the hot deserts of 4th century Egypt. When Constantine was Christianizing the Roman Empire, holy men fled to the wastelands, responding to Christ's urging to forsake the world and follow in his footsteps. St. Anthony, the first great hermit, and Pacomius, the founder saint of the earliest communal settlement, who received from an angel the habit which monks still wear today as their spiritual armor, the angelic habit. And St. Basil, the first legislator of monasticism. The first known settlers on Athos arrived in the ninth century, hermits living alone in caves. The word monk comes from the Greek monos, meaning a solitary, one who is alone with God. About a hundred years later, this great peak also beckoned to those who wished for a more organized monastic life. And this monastery was built, the great Lavra. Its inspiration and builder was an orphan scholar from Constantinople, Athanasios the Athenite. Money and patronage came from the great Byzantine general and future emperor, Nikiforos Phokas, the white death of the Saracens. To begin with, nothing went right. What Athanasios and his men built by day, demons tore down by night. In despair, Athanasios was ready to leave the mountain. Tradition has it that the Virgin Mary intervened. In a vision, she told him to strike a rock with his staff. From it gushed forth a stream of cool, clear water. And to this day, the monks of the great Lavra pay homage at the Virgin's spring. <laughs> With fresh hope, 
Athanasius returned to finish what he had started. But his friend Phocas was murdered, and it was his successor, Emperor John Zemiskis, who financed its completion and gave Lavra its charter, placing it under imperial protection. The great Lavra survives virtually intact and is the oldest and most prestigious of the Athenite monasteries. Labra owes much to Byzantine emperors. Royal gifts and largesse were heaped upon the monks. Among them, this great golden bejeweled gospel of Phocas. And countless manuscripts. Icons. reliquaries. These are still among the greatest treasures of the mountain. Lavra thus set the pattern on which subsequent monasteries were established. Despite the ravages of history, Athos grew. Now there are 20 sovereign monasteries with many dependencies. All predate the fall of Byzantium in the 15th century. Many early monastic centers were sited in remote, desolate places. Athos is remote, but it is a paradise, rich in vegetation, flowers, and wildlife. It is also known as the Garden of the Virgin Mary. It is believed by the monks that after the death of Christ, but before her own death, the Mother of God visited the Holy Mountain and said, this place will be mine forever. And so the monks feel that they are under the special protection of the Holy Virgin. Athos is not just a place of holy people, it is itself a holy place. Before we think of the monks, we should think of the mountain, the holy mountain. The great pyramid rising six and a half thousand feet out of the sea. This is a place where God is present, where the saints are present. This is a point in sacred space.
The 20th century has as yet made few inroads on Athos. There are times when you feel you have crossed the threshold into another age, particularly when you walk by yourself in the forest and up the mountain. By walking alone, you will discover something that is the essence of the holy mountain. Stillness, silence. Silence not just as an emptiness, but as a presence. Silence not just as the absence of speech, but as an attitude of listening. The hermit tradition, which reached here more than a thousand years ago, still lives on. Solitary monks continue to inhabit cells in the most unusual and inaccessible places. It can take many hours to walk between monasteries, but for this hermit, the journey home can take all day by chain up the mountainside. The hermit lives his rigorous existence at the mercy of nature, naked, as it were, before the face of God. Once, this monk was a Yugoslav nobleman. Now he follows a life of contemplation, supplementing his usual vegetarian diet with fish from the sea hundreds of feet below. Between the communal life in a large organized monastery and the way of the solitary, there is a third pattern of life on Athos, that of monks living in tiny communities called skeets. These monks survive by their handiwork, using skills and techniques handed down through the centuries. Water-powered lathes are unusual, even on Athos. Monks in the skeets must be self-supporting. These will be sold to raise money.
The monk is forbidden to own property. He must own nothing, not even a penny. I have been here in the monastery for 70 years, and with the grace of God, I worked as hard as I could. And for 40 years as abbot, I managed millions, not just for the monastery, but also for the holy community of Athos. And today, I don't even own a penny. Boxwood carving like this has been a tradition on Athos since the 15th or 16th century. Although the mountain has its closest ties with Greece, and everyone who lives here is granted Greek citizenship, Athos is very much a pan-Orthodox center. There have been Russian monks, uh, Serbs from Yugoslavia, Bulgarians, Romanians, and now in the last few years, there's an increasing number of people from the West. From Britain, there are a few monks. From France, Switzerland, Germany, even one from Peru. The Athenite day begins at sunset. For here, we are in ancient Byzantine time. As if the empire of Byzantium still existed. The monks gather for the evening vigil, a time for meditation. The most important thing that a monk does is to pray. St. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, says, pray without ceasing. Not just morning and evening, not just seven times a day, but without ceasing. This is a knotted rosary. Every monk carries a small version. On this, he repeats constantly the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. For the monk, prayer is not just one activity among others. Prayer is to be a dimension that enters into everything else you do. And the hope is, that you will not just be a person who says prayers from time to time, but a person who is prayer all the time. So everything else that goes on in the monastery, as well as the services, is seen in relation to prayer.
This is one of the many kitchens used to cook the large meals. Little sign of modern convenience is here. Communal meals like this are a ritual. The worship continues, whether you be monk, pilgrim, or just a visitor. Hospitality has always been understood as a vital part of the monastic life. The guest, we are told, is to be received as Christ himself. The monks see the receiving of guests not as an unavoidable duty, not as a disturbance, they see it as a privilege. But today, with the extreme ease of travel, there is a problem. The monasteries are prepared to receive pilgrims, but what are they to do about tourists? One of the most precious qualities of Athos is its silence, its stillness. If you have too many visitors, that will be destroyed. So today, regrettably perhaps, we have to have restrictions on who is admitted to Athos. There are very few places left now in Western Europe where you can find real silence. Athos is one of them, and we must guard this precious gift. Most fishermen catch for themselves or other people, not this kindly Athenite monk. He fishes for his cats, his companions. mountain is a paradox. Some might even call it an anachronism. There are many reasons for this, not least amongst them its inaccessibility. Although there are rough mountain tracks from the mainland, there is only one way in, by boat to the Athenite port of Daphne. This small boat serves not only as a supply lifeline, bringing goods from the outside world, but it also brings those who wish to visit the mountain. This is a journey to another age, but only men embark upon it. Women are banned from the mountain and have been from its earliest days. If a monk has chosen the life of celibacy, then it's easier for him not to meet women. But uh, on Athos, it is not only women who are excluded, it is also female animals, at any rate, domestic animals like cows or sheep. This has a slightly different reason. In the Orthodox tradition, what the monks do primarily is market gardening. They grow vegetables for their own use. If they began to have animals 
and to breed animals, this could be an interference with the life of prayer and silence. Cows have to be milked twice a day, even if it is a great festival and you want to be in church. All visitors to the Holy Mountain must take this road from Daphne to the village of Caries, the administrative heart of the peninsula. Here, you will be told whether you can stay and for how long. No one can get into a monastery without a pass. For fellow monks and genuine pilgrims, there is little restriction. But tourists are carefully controlled. A three-day permit is the maximum most casual visitors can expect. The Athenite state is run by delegates from the 20 ruling monasteries. Once a year, they gather to elect the epistasia, four monks, one of whom is the protos, the first. Each member receives a quarter of the great Athenite seal with which all decisions are ratified. Today, the permanent population of Athos, 1,500 or so, is a mere shadow of what it was. Once, as many as 20,000 holy men are believed to have lived around this mountain. Reliable figures, though, are only available from the turn of this century. When I came here in 1910, monastic life was thriving, both in terms of quality and numbers. In 1908, when a census of the Holy Mountain was taken, the Athenite monks numbered 8,000. Of these, 4,000 were Greeks and 4,000 were other nationals. Among the latter, 3,500 were Russians and the remaining 500 were Romanians, Serbs and Bulgarians. Russian monks have been on Athos since the 11th century but now only a handful remain. This is the Russian monastery of St. Pantaliemon. These are the heirs to a magnificent Russian tradition. The lavishness of this late 19th century church bears witness to the generous patronage of not only pious Russian rulers, but also that of countless ordinary believers. Here, as you can see, was a refectory where a thousand monks would eat. The abbot and his council sat here at the first table. After the liturgy, in which 50 priests and 50 deacons officiated, they would come here in procession, chanting, while 25 bells would toll. During the great festivals, there wasn't enough room here or in the adjoining spaces. They therefore laid planks outside, reaching all the way to the chapel, and people would eat there. And after the meal, the monastery would provide alms to the poor. Should he be a priest or a deacon, he would get some vestments at the door. Should he be a layman and not a monk, he would receive some money and some clothes. But should the ascetics or hermits ask for arms, they would receive caviar by the large shovel which was overflowing out of the barrels that came from Russia. They were all very generous, and this place was then in its glory. Now, Tsarism will not return to Russia, but Christianity one day certainly will, and then they shall return. Then, by the will of God, this place will be revived, as we can see in some of the other monasteries. 
Following the First World War, very few new monks came to the mountain. And by the 1960s, the situation was growing critical. The numbers were falling. Nearly all the monks were over 50. It was a rare thing to see a monk with no white hairs in his beard. Then, in the late 60s, it began to change. Young people began coming again to the Holy Mountain. In many cases, they were people who had completed a university education. Some of them had already started a career in the outside world. Monasteries which 15 years ago had only a few elderly monks, barely able to keep the life going, are now full of young monks with a sense of purpose and hope. Pratatam, the great communal church at the heart of the Holy Mountain, dedicated, like Athos itself, to the Virgin Mary. The visit of a bishop, representing the Patriarch of Constantinople, is the occasion for this ceremony. The disrobing and robing of the bishop is symbolic, a formal part of orthodox ceremonial, based on a thousand-year imperial protocol. The rich brocaded vestments and the jewellery echo the orientalized splendor of the Byzantine court. As well as being a place of worship, the Protaton is also one of the few surviving examples of refined Byzantine painting of the highest quality. This cycle of murals dates to the early 14th century and is attributed to the genius of Manuel Pancelanos. Little is known about him. His work is unsigned, but his name has become legendary and he is undoubtedly one of the great masters of Byzantine painting. For the first time, these paintings are seen in anything other than flickering candlelight.
For art historians and believers alike, Athos represents a rich artistic tradition and allows one to see a range of Eastern Christian art which spans 10 centuries. These were painted as late as the 18th century by Dionysius of Forna in his cell in Cariès. He is the author of the renowned painter's manual, describing both the techniques and the iconography of Byzantine painting. of icons still goes on on Athos, the residue of a once glorious tradition. The place of retreat and contemplation that Athos is today belies its monumental impact and influence on Christianity. The rays of this beacon have shone out to the most distant of lands. In centuries past, its importance often made it a target for those who wished to silence it, as well as for those attracted by the lure of plunder. Despots and pirates failed to humble or break Athos, but they did force the monks to build their monasteries like fortresses. The raiders were held at bay. of the mountain are as resolute as they've ever been. These are the descendants of holy men who reacted strongly when ideologically threatened. When, in the 14th century, Western rationalists said it was impossible to have a direct personal experience of God, it was the monks of Athos who stood firm. Chief among them was the towering figure of St. Gregory Palamas, who spoke out strongly in defense of the thousand-year-old orthodox belief about the way in which God relates to his creation, the world. God is unknowable, agreed Palamas, but he does communicate himself to us through his energies. To use an analogy, just as the sun, a flaming disk in the sky, instills the earth with warmth and light, so God's energies penetrate and transfigure his creation. Nothing apart from prayer, worship, uh, spiritual experience, and uh, an extremely rigorous ascetic life has ever taken place on Athos. In a way, it is as totally uh, centered on the spiritual experience as a laboratory is centered on uh, experiment and research. Nothing else happens there.
The sounding of the Samandron calls the monks to church, recalling Noah's urgent summoning of the animals to seek sanctuary in the Ark. The church is the Ark of the Faithful. Before every Orthodox service, the church and all participants are sensed. They are formally welcomed. This sensing includes all the icons and holy relics, the remains and possessions of saints. They are not keepsakes or objects of curiosity, but an integral part of the worship. Relics are understandable only if you uh, share with us the, f the belief that the body of a human being is not a temporary abode for an eternal soul, but is called to eternal life. Uh, orthodoxy, in the, ways, in, the, in the words of one of our theologians, is the only true materialism. Like the relics, the icons are not just inert matter, wood and paint. They are transfigured, just as the bread and wine of the communion is transfigured into the body and blood of Christ. It is impossible to estimate how many icons there are on the holy mountain. In the West, many would have great monetary value. But here, they are much more than religious pictures. They are sacred, to be blessed, prayed before, venerated. Contemplating death, the belief by some Athenite monks that they are the living dead is not a morbid one. It is based on the monk's quest to become an earthly angel. The monk offers that which Christ offered on Calvary. He joins his blood with the blood of Christ. He joins his body with the bodies of the martyrs. He is someone who dies every day. What the monk has to offer is his corpse, his remains. And these remains are always God-bearing. And as to his familiarization with death, how is it possible for someone not to become familiar with his wife when he gets married? The wife with the husband and the husband with the wife. How is it possible, therefore, for someone becoming a monk not to become familiar with death? For that is his own wedding. And the tomb, in other words, his cell, is his bridal suite. There he meets his groom, Christ. The monk, therefore, is the one who carries within him death. In other words, he transforms death into life, just as Christ, in his human nature, transform death into life eternal, life immortal.
20th century lies beyond the horizon. So far, it has done little more than dent this idyllic bastion of solitude. Whether you are on ethos in the lushness of the uh, countryside, whether you are in a Romanesque monastery uh, in the West or in the wilderness, the basic essential experience which you are looking for is a sense of being face to face with the living God and seeing things as God sees them or as he allows you to see them. So the monks of the Holy Mountain have left the door ajar, enough for a fleeting glimpse of their sanctuary and the faith it harbors. They know that once left open, it can never be completely shut. The monks will have to make sure that there is an antechamber of their monastic life which is accessible to the onlooker and a secret garden which the onlooker will never see because it is only with spiritual eyes that one can see that. Uh, they will be able to commune with the services, to see the monks, and only those who have eyes to see will see. The other ones will be blind. They will see buildings, pieces of art, uh, men dressing and behaving in incomprehensible and strange ways. reclines in contemplation.